So moving on to our second plenary is Matthew Mimiaga. He is a professor of behavioral and social health sciences and epidemiology, School of Public Health, Brown University. He is also the director of Division of Epidemiology and Global Health Research, Fenway Institute. His talk today will be on the effective responses and harm reduction for problematic chemsex. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the conference organizers for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'll be speaking about effective responses and harm reduction for problematic chemsex. Just a quick overview of my presentation. Uh, initially, I'm going to define chemsex and the public health problem, talk a little bit about the epidemiology and among MSM and its, uh, and its relation to the theory of syndemics. The mainstay of treatment approaches, so um, cognitive behavioral therapy, contingency management-based interventions, uh, promise with other psychosocial treatments, uh, which my group is developing back in the US, uh, pharmacological treatments, and harm reduction approaches. Chemsex, also called party and play and sexualized drug use, is a name given to uh, increasingly popular practice using recreational drugs to facilitate uh, or enhance sex between gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Uh, during chemsex parties, uh, people will engage in extended hours of sexual uh, risk behavior and extreme sex due to complete disinhibition. Uh, here, this table uh, represents uh, uh, the drugs that are used, uh, common street names, intended and adverse effects. Uh, these drugs induce euphoria, enhance libido, and reduce uh, sexual and social inhibitions. I'm coming to your house tonight. Yeah. Who's going? Sexy boy. I'm taking alcohol, man. And what else? That's it. And then? What else? Methadone. These days, you're coming to London to find your gay life, and you find Grindr. And within perhaps four conversations, you're going to be introduced to chems. Within eight conversations on Grindr, you're going to be introduced to injecting or slamming. Originally, sex and drugs were two separate things. Somewhere along the line, you were no longer having sex without drugs, and you were no longer having drugs without sex. Tina, TG, and they all mean one thing. It's time to party. The feelings that you got is like a firework display in your soul. It looks to some people a greedy, self-indulgent, promiscuous gay boys going out and having fun on, on drugs. It's more complicated than that. The gay scene can be such a lonely, alienating place. Drugs gave me the confidence that I never had. Vulnerable gay men with issues around sex. New drugs have tapped into that problem rather well and changing technology. What they call the perfect storm. Oh. Once you cross the line, once you're in that world of chems and you're in that world of incredible sex, if you never come back across the line and see what else is there, you, it's very easy to stay in there. Being diagnosed with HIV, so yeah, it happened. After I'd OD'd on G. Five gay men are being diagnosed with HIV every single day in London. Just in London. And that's a huge number. There's something about our relationship to our sex that's causing harm. And that needs addressing. So that video depicts uh, a common occurrence across anywhere you go in the United States, uh, here in Thailand or in Asia, um, and, uh, and also in Western Europe, uh, especially as related to using location-based apps, finding um, people to hook up with and have sex. Um, there have been two systematic reviews in 2019 uh, that uh, explain sexualized drug use among men who have sex with men. Uh, in both of the reviews, uh, chemsex was associated with condomless sex, 
group sex, transactional sex, negative health outcomes such as HIV and sexually transmitted infections, uh, and psychosocial problems such as depression. Uh, across studies, as high as 20% of MSM have used meth amphetamine uh, in the context of sex in the past six months. So adverse health outcomes often present in clusters and interact with each other to affect health uh, of particular groups. Uh, applying a syndemics model emphasizes how intertwined epidemics have an additive impact on, uh, on outcomes such as HIV uh, infection or sexual risk taking. Uh, across several uh, cross-sectional studies, uh, studies have suggested that co-occurring epidemics or syndemics play an important role in uh, HIV infection and sexual risk among gender and minority uh, groups, uh, particularly with respect to risky sexual behavior and number of casual sex partners. We were interested in understanding this uh, phenomenon among men in the US. Uh, the question is, do psychosocial health problems predict HIV seroconversion? So we have a lot of nice data that showed uh, cross-sectional associations, and we wanted to really understand the causal relationship between uh, the two. So our hypothesis was an increasing number of sexual health conditions would increase the odds of sexual risk behavior and the hazard of incident HIV infections. The, uh, the, the psychosocial problems that we looked at were depression, uh, stimulant use, uh, which includes methamphetamine, uh, poly drug use, so three or more um, drugs, not including stimulants, uh, heavy alcohol use, and childhood sexual abuse. Uh, the data come from Project Explore. It was an efficacy trial of a behavioral HIV prevention intervention conducted in six US cities, Boston, Chicago, Denver, New York, San Francisco, and Seattle. Uh, upon entry at baseline, participants were HIV uninfected, uh, 16 years of age or older, uh, reported anal intercourse with, greater, uh, with one or more men uh, in the past year. Assessments were conducted via a COSI. Uh, we also conducted HIV counseling and testing every six months for a period of 48 months of follow-up. Uh, outcomes of interest were seroconversion, any unprotected anal sex, and any unprotected serodiscordant anal sex, or condomless serodiscordant anal sex. Uh, analysis uh, for the seroconversion, we use time varying cock proportional hazard models, and for the sexual risk, we use GEE models. Uh, psychosocial health conditions were highly prevalent at baseline, including depression, childhood sexual abuse, stimulant use, poly drug use, heavy alcohol use. Uh, there was not a statistically significant uh, difference in change in prevalence of count of psychosocial health problems over study follow-up, so they stayed pretty stable um, at each assessment time point. Uh, from this uh, table, you can see that syndemics predict sexual risk. So there's a positive dose response relationship uh, when looking at the number of uh, psychosocial factors um, in relation to unprotected sex and serodiscordant unprotected sex um, with a positive dose response relationship such that with the increased number of psychosocial problems, you're more likely to engage in risk. Uh, similarly, the hazard of HIV seroconversion was highest for those with more uh, psychosocial health problems over follow-up, with a trend towards lower hazard for fewer conditions. So those uh, reporting four or more conditions had uh, a hazard ratio of 8.69 um, times uh, uh, the rate of seroconversion. Uh, to determine whether or not the syndemic effect was driven by certain combinations of psychosocial conditions, uh, I examined all the different possible patterns of psychosocial conditions, which were 32. Uh, we calculated the population attributable uh, hazard fractions to assess the proportion of HIV uh, seroconversion attributable to each distinct pattern of psychosocial problems. Uh, and we use the cutoff of, uh, uh, of 6.3%, which was the overall seroconversion rate for the entire sample. Uh, in looking at 
this table, you can see that only one uh, of the, so we, we categorized um, or grouped groups by uh, low risk versus high risk. Um, and so those that were low risk were uh, equal or, or less than 6.3%, and those that were high risk were above. Uh, and only one of the low risk patterns included stimulant use. Well, when you look at the high risk patterns, uh, uh, of the 18 high-risk patterns, 15 of them included stimulant use. So we wanted to, we were interested in this. Um, stimulant use seems to be playing a major role here. Uh, so we were interested in understanding whether or not uh, stimulant use uh, was driving this association. So we separated stimulant use from the uh, syndemics model, and uh, both stimulant use and the syndemics variable were associated with an increased hazard of HIV seroconversion. Thus, the syndemics effect was attenuated, uh, but remained large and uh, independent, uh, remained large and independent uh, in terms of its effect on seroconversion. Um, than stimulant use alone. So it's not just stimulant use, it's these other psychosocial problems that are also contributing largely to risk. So why is it important to develop behavioral interventions to treat meth use among MSM? Well, currently there are no FDA approved medications for methamphetamine dependence. Uh, there is a recent study which I'll talk about in a little bit uh, with mirtazapine, which shows uh, that it is efficacious, but it's not yet FDA approved. Um, the mainstay of crystal methamphetamine uh, treatment is behavioral modification using interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy and contingency management. Uh, and among MSM, uh, methamphetamine use is 20 times that of the general population with an estimated of 10 to 25% reporting crystal meth use in the past six months in the context of sex. A number of studies have documented the association of, um, with increased sexual risk taking, including marathon sex sections, um, increased libido and sexual pleasure, increased number of partners, and so on. So, Two studies that I'm going to talk about, uh, which are which are, are the overall projects called Project Impact. So it's an intervention with men who have sex with men to prevent acquisition of HIV through crystal methamphetamine treatment. So crystal methamphetamine, as many of you know, is a stimulant drug with common street names, uh, Tina, meth. It's a white odorless powder, powder that can be snorted, uh, smoked, injected, and swallowed. Uh, highly toxic um, ingredients, uh, there's a list right there. The high lasts between six to 12 hours depending, to days depending on the binge. Uh, it affects the central nervous system by increasing levels of alertness, exhilaration, euphoria. You have this cascading release of dopamine. Um, makes you feel very good. Well, symptoms of withdrawal include these uh, right here, but I highlighted uh, strong cravings and depression because these are sort of the two main uh, focus areas of our, our intervention. So in addition to it having a negative impact on one's psychosocial um, uh, uh, factors, it also has a deteriorating effect on, uh, on, on some users' physical uh, well-being as well. Um, so this is a series of photos graphically illustrating the deterioration of a methamphetamine user over 10 years. Uh, we first conducted qualitative work in order to gain insight about HIV prevention um, in, among this group, and I specifically targeted men who believed that they had become infected with HIV in the context of using methamphetamine uh, or engaging in sexual behavior while under the influence of meth. Uh, the, we conducted 20 qualitative interviews. 95% uh, of the men reported a loss of interest in other activities as a side effect of coming off the drug. So things that used to be pleasurable and exciting were no longer pleasurable and exciting uh, without using the drug and, and combining it with sex. Uh, so the hypothesized mechanism of action of this intervention is that behavioral activation will re-engage participants in pleasurable non-drug using activities. 
uh, so interests or hobbies that were enjoyable before crystal meth use, which will act as a natural reinforcement for functional behavior, um, improve depressed mood when not on crystal by experiencing increases in mastery um, and pleasure, and decrease overall distress so that men can better uptake uh, HIV prevention messaging. So the these two studies, the main purposes of them were uh, to examine feasibility and acceptability, uh, or to enhance participant acceptability. So the first study was an open pilot trial where we conducted an iterative process uh, for behavioral or psychosocial treatment development in that we initially conducted qualitative interviews to inform the treatment manual. Uh, you develop the treatment manual with expert, uh, uh, expert guidance, and then uh, carried it out with two participants, uh, and, and then conducted exit interviews with those participants, found out what was helpful, what wasn't helpful, revised the treatment manual accordingly, carried it out in the next two, and so on. So by the time we got to the mini RCT pilot, uh, it was highly acceptable and relevant to the participant population. This is our model of intervention effects. Um, so eligibility criteria included men who were age 18 years of age or older, HIV uninfected, reported unprotected sex, uh, anal sex with another man while under the influence of meth in the prior three months, and had a meth positive toxicology screen at baseline. Uh, primary outcomes are condomless uh, anal sex acts without protection of consistent prep use, meth uh, use, so number of uh, distinct episodes of meth use, and depressive symptoms. Uh, behavioral activation uh, is the main uh, uh, psychosocial intervention that we're using, which is an empirically supported treatment for depression uh, that involves relearning how to engage in life by identifying and actively engaging in pleasurable events without using meth. So remember from the qualitative work, we learned that men who used meth were no longer interested uh, in act other activities. So we thought, well, what could potentially re-engage men in, uh, in, in activities that they once found interesting? Uh, without using meth. So the intervention itself consists of 10 weekly in-person sessions, which include two HIV risk reduction sessions, two sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy for reducing substance use, six sessions of behavioral activation, and one final session for uh, focused on relapse uh, prevention. Each session was delivered by a therapist, master's level therapist, and, uh, and lasted approximately 50 minutes. So first, psychoeducation regarding HIV acquisition risk behaviors is provided, um, including topics such as condomless sex uh, with and without PrEP, uh, sex with, uh, within the context of a primary partner with a known undetectable viral load due to antiretroviral therapy adherence, um, next, motivation and change for sexual behaviors is promoted through non-judgmental exploration of the participant's sexual history. Uh, and uh, participants are supported um, as they develop strategies to change their behaviors. Uh, the two cognitive behavioral therapy sessions help them identify triggers, um, develop assertiveness and refusal skills, uh, problem solving skills that present a, uh, to problem solve situations that present a high risk uh, for lapsing or avoiding certain places, uh, their schedule, changing schedule, managing money, um, those sorts of things. In these sessions, the interventionist also provides information about how to differentiate a lapse from a relapse. Uh, and participants determine their substance abuse goals and together with the participant and the interventionist monitor their progress towards the goals over the course um, of the uh, treatment. Behavioral activation is five sessions. Um, the, intervention works, the interventionist works with the participant to increase the amount of time the participant spends engaged in pleasurable and mastery uh, inducing activities without stimulant use. Uh, which in turn uh, work to promote positive mood, uh, reduce the desire to use substances, and bolster participants' motivation to engage in sexual risk reduction. 
uh, components of problem solving training are, are discussed consistent with all modules, a motivational style is employed, mood and activity monitoring sheets uh, between sessions track daily behavior, and the, uh, during the sessions there's a review of these sheets between the interventionist and the participant um, in, in efforts to incorporate more activities that promote a sense of pleasure and mastery, uh, which are core to the efficacy of the BA approach. The intervention components, um, the last session is uh, a plan for relapse prevention. It's a, uh, it really a transition for participants to be their own therapists, to review skills discussed and lessons learned, and to engage in problem solving for any future uh, problems that present. For the open pilot trial, the majority of men were or the mean age was 40, the majority of the men were white, highly educated, and, uh, and identified as gay or homosexual. Uh, in terms of our initial findings, we see significant within-person reductions uh, in unprotected anal sex episodes using meth and unprotected uh, anal sex episodes with HIV unknown serostatus partners using meth. So it goes from baseline to the post time point, which is really the three month assessment, and then three months after that, which is the six month assessment. So those initial gains within person are at least sustained for um, six months. So Len, this um, was great pilot data to uh, apply for another grant, which is the next state step in uh, psychosocial treatment development. Uh, we conducted a pilot randomized controlled trial with 41 participants. So 21 to the intervention arm, 20 to the control. Uh, there were 10 sessions of behavioral activation with risk reduction counseling. The standard of care group received just the risk reduction counseling component without any additional intervention. Participants were followed for six months and the main outcomes were similar to the outcomes in the open pilot trial. Um, 46 of the HIV uh, infected MSM uh, at sexual risk of acquiring HIV met DSM uh, four criteria for methamphetamine uh, dependence uh, and 41 were randomized. This is our study flow chart, uh, which I sort of just went over, but uh, describes randomization, uh, you know, their assignment and the three month and six month post uh, intervention uh, assessments. So participant retention at six months, uh, at six month follow-up was uh, very high. It was 98%. Overall completion of the intervention sessions was 93%. So 93% of the counseling sessions were actually attended among those randomized to the intervention arm. Uh, in looking at longest period of no meth use in the past 90 days, at the six month assessment, we see a significant um, uh, higher level of longest period of no meth use in the past 90 days among the intervention group as compared to the control. Similarly, with number of times uh, or uh, condomless anal sex acts with a partner who was HIV serodiscordant status or unknown, and uh, condomless anal sex with a partner who was HIV serodiscordant um, or unknown while using meth. Uh, both, at both at the six month assessment for both outcomes showed a significant difference between the intervention group uh, as compared to the control. So findings, or this is preliminary evidence, it suggests that the behavioral activation and risk reduction uh, intervention may well be suited uh, it may have a potential to affect uh, significant reductions in both sexual risk and HIV and stimulant use for MSM struggling with stimulant use disorder and is worthy of testing in a full-scale trial. So that's currently what we're doing. Uh, currently underway is an R01 that's looking, we're in year four, um, where we're currently looking at the intervention um, compared to a time-matched control group, as well as a, um, uh, the regular control, which is just the risk reduction sessions. We're also looking at cost effectiveness of the intervention, um, and we're hopeful. Uh, the next intervention I'm gonna talk about is project reward. Uh, so there's a high prevalence of stimulant use among HIV infected individuals, uh, which is associated with suboptimal antiretroviral therapy, uh, HIV treatment interruptions, uh, detectable uh, viral load, 
transmission of HIV via increased sexual risk behavior. So contingency management, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is an initially effective treatment for stimulant use. So in the studies employing contingency management at the acute assessment visit, you see this amazing decline in stimulant use. But then over time at follow-up assessments, uh, it's rarely sustained or it goes back to what it was at baseline. Um, and be, we use behavioral uh, activation as, a, um, as an approach for depression, which again involves uh, identifying and participating in pleasurable goal-directed activities as a possible way to extend or sustain the um, initial gain seen uh, from the contingency management. So a potential approach to address the contingency management rebound effect informed by formative qualitative work with the participant population, we conducted an open pilot trial. Uh, participants received uh, uh, 10 sessions once weekly of behavioral activation and then thrice weekly uh, toxicology screens for 12 weeks. Contingencies rewarded for negative toxicology screens to the test supported re-engagement in positive life activities, hobbies or interests. Um, for example, uh, someone wanted a gym membership and we were able to use the incentives that he had earned as a way of getting him a gym membership. Major assessments were conducted at, three, at baseline three and six months. Toxicology screens were repeated prior to the six month assessment. Uh, 11 participants with stimulant use disorder were enrolled. Uh, the mean age was 46 with 14% uh, percent identified as a racial ethnic minority. In terms of our findings, uh, we saw a reduction in self-reported stimulant use um, with in-person uh, reduction in self-reported stimulant use, reduction in positive toxicology screens, exit interviews showed uh, high participant acceptability um, and feasibility to carry out the intervention. 100% uh, of intervention sessions were attended and participants rated the intervention uh, universally as acceptable or very acceptable. Um, so this could be a potential option to augment the potency um, and sustained impact of contingency management for this population and worthy of testing in a randomized controlled trial, which is our next steps um, with this project. In terms of pharmacological treatments, uh, mirtazapine, which is an oral medication used to treat depression, um, was uh, examined in a double-blind randomized controlled trial to determine the efficacy of mirtazapine against a um, placebo control. Uh, 30 milligrams um, matched to a placebo once daily for 24 weeks with background counseling for 30 minutes um, of CBT and MI-based counseling across groups. Uh, the study enrolled men who have sex with men and transgender women who use, with methamphetamine uh, use disorder. Uh, compared to the matched placebo arm, those who received mirtazapine showed a 33% uh, reduction in methamphetamine positive urine tests uh, at three months and about 25% at both six and nine months. So this could be potentially higher, the effect, if adherence to the medication was higher. So only 39% uh, reported adherence, and that was across both the placebo and the mirtazapine group. Um, and then there were some benefits at six months to, um, to sexual risk reduction. Uh, so mirtazapine is the first medication to demonstrate efficacy in treating methamphetamine use disorder across two trials now. Uh, so continuing to invest in, in designing and behavioral treatment approaches such as Project Impact uh, is important not only because some people will not want to take medications, but also mirtazapine isn't going to work for everyone. Uh, and some MSM may require an adherence uh, intervention in combination with mirtazapine to increase the effect size. Uh, in terms of a few harm reduction approaches, uh, first I'm going to talk about on-demand PrEP um, and whether or not it's suitable for MSM who uh, practice chemsex. So the present study uh, was an open label extension of um, the Ipergay study. Um, the objectives were to characterize uh, psychoactive uh, drugs used during their most recent sexual encounter and to study the association of chemsex and PrEP use. Um, there were no significant differences in chemsex 
chemsexers versus non-chemsexers regarding sociodemographic characteristics. However, uh, chemsexers were more, had uh, having more vulnerable psychological profile, um, higher scores on sensation seeking, and so on. Um, chemsex is associated with uh, sex parties, um, uh, casual partners, high risk or hardcore uh, practices, uh, higher HIV transmission risk perceptions, and PrEP as a suitable tool to reduce HIV transmission in chemsex users. Um, this is what I find, I think, most interesting with this study, is in looking at factors associated with PrEP use at the most recent sexual encounter, those who reported chemsex were two, had 2.2 um, higher odds of using PrEP at their most recent encounter. So uh, in terms of a harm reduction approach, this is certainly a viable option for uh, those who use methamphetamine or uh, other um, stimulants. Um, in terms of uh, local uh, harm reduction approaches, Asia's leading HIV advocacy group launched the first and only chemsex uh, harm reduction campaign in Thai for men who have sex with men. Uh, Test BBK developed non-judgmental uh, uh, resources in Thai language to help men reduce drug-associated harm. They also um, encouraged them to access HIV counseling and testing services and treatment services. So since November of 2019, two uh, main information hubs uh, show that greater than 65,000 visitors have, uh, have looked at these sites. Um, in, in the next month, something that ex is exciting is Test BBK, funded by the Elton John Foundation, uh, will, uh, will produce harm reduction PSA videos, but also how to organize safer chemsex parties um, in the form of a booklet for participants or for uh, their clients to use. Um, Test BBK's harm reduction resources can potentially be a model for other organizations in Thailand uh, in, or in the region to consider producing more community-based uh, harm reduction uh, programs. And lastly, I just wanted to mention uh, David Stewart's Chemsex Care Plan. Uh, you can watch a video tutorial uh, and click on Begin. Uh, and then choose the option that best suits your current goals. So one of the options is playing more safely, which then offers up risk reduction uh, strategies for the person on the site. Uh, you can also select abstaining from chemsex, and then it uh, covers the, or it involves acknowledging and addressing the following factors. Um, and and is just overall a really good tool, I think, for chemsex users to use both in terms of addressing their, uh, their individualistic needs um, and where they're at in terms of wanting to reduce or uh, engage in safer sex practices. Uh, and I will end there. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to my collaborators um, and funders for these projects. <laughs>